Travel is not just about seeing the beautiful vistas or scenery, it's about eating the different food and hearing new music and walking the streets and feeling the cobbles under my feet and walking in the mountains and feeling the gradients going up and down and through the forest and hearing birds and sea life and smelling seals or hearing penguins in Antarctica. It's all that and, it's, and ultimately of course it's about meeting the people and immersing yourself into one's, into their culture and learning about how they live day to day. Tony Giles, a.k.a. Tony the Traveler, backpacking around the world, seeing the world my way. I've been quite lucky to sort of wandering around the world with my cane, sort of looking sort of quite innocent and lost, and people just tend to come towards me and want to look after me, so it's been quite remarkable. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at BlindAbilities, and download the free BlindAbilities app from the App Store. That's two words, Blind Abilities. This podcast is underwritten in part by State Services for the Blind. Live, work, read, succeed. Yeah, confidence is the key, building up your confidence and don't being afraid to ask for help because we all need help whether we can see or not. Antarctica is probably not on the map, is it? Yeah, it's on the map. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's at the bottom. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I did a cruise from South America. That's the best way to get there. Well, it's the only way to get there, really. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, done that a few years ago. You've been to Antarctica. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. Not cheap, but worth it. Really? So, yeah, yeah. So it cost me about uh, $5,000 US. Because I had to pay for a guide, I had my own guide, they wouldn't sort of let me wander around by myself. I've been a bit worried I might step on a penguin. <laughs> Welcome to Blind Abilities, I'm Jeff Thompson. Have you ever thought about traveling the world, just grabbing a backpack and taking off? For over the last 20 years, Tony Giles has done just that. He's known as Tony the Traveler, and he's made his way to the Blind Abilities studios to talk about his two books, his journey, what he's doing up next, and a little bit of advice from Tony the Traveler. Please let me welcome... Tony Giles. How are you doing, Tony? I'm good, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm um, tra- traveling around the world, trying to visit uh, every country. I've been uh, traveling for the last 20 years. Um, I'm totally blind. I've got a rare eye condition called cone dystrophy and, all, and photophobia. So it means I was born with no color cells, so I've never seen color. And I was light sensitive as a child, as a baby. Um, so I spent the sort of first two years of my life in the dark and then I was sort of given dark glasses a bit like Stevie Wonder and then sort of about the age of three or four ran around in the street played with my friends and played with a soccer ball and was given a big three wheel bike to sort of ride around and sort of crash into walls and lampposts and stuff so yeah that was kind of my up- upbringing and then I uh, went to a school for visually impaired kids at the age of five uh, about 30 20, 30 miles away from my home. So I used to go there every day by taxi. And um, I could actually see big black letters on white paper from sort of the age of five and sort of seven and eight. I could see the contrast, black and white. And then um, as I got older, my light and sensitivity started to go. So um, my eye condition never changed, but my sensitivity to light got lesser and lesser and print got smaller. So by the age of eight, I'd sort of stopped learning. I needed to sort of learn Braille. And so I was packed off to a boarding school about I don't know, more than 300 miles away from my home. Sort of lived there for six weeks, eight weeks at a time. And learned Braille, learned mobility, used a long cane. So at the age of 11, 12, and then eventually started sort of going off the school campus and going to the local shops and eventually sort of crossing roads and catching buses and trains. So by the age of sort of 14, 15, I was traveling home to see my family independently by myself and going to the, the city centre and to Coventry in the Midlands. So I was sort of going to the library and getting um, audio books and music. So that's sort of helping my education. And then um, I sort of idea of me traveling sort of came from my dad um he was a lot older than my mum. he told me stories he was in the merchant navy in the early 50s he told me about traveling across australia by train east coast to west coast sort of took him eight days by steam train and going up the st lawrence river with iceberg floating down the sides oh that sounds exciting and then when i was 11 i started reading audio books and hearing different stories and about the second world war and about travel and all these kind of things and when i was 16 i got the opportunity to go to uh, boston 
on the east coast of America with the school and that was totally different you know, wide open sidewalk much more spacious surroundings and people with different funny accents that talk loudly and people in the UK are quite reserved and not very talkative in public and our Americans were totally different in that respect I was in 1995 when the, um, the baseball strike was on I remember that I remember going to Salem just outside Boston because we were studying about the uh, 19, uh, the 1692 um, witchcraft trials. So I went there and that was all interesting. And I thought, oh, I like this. This is interesting. And got to eat big steaks and stay in a huge hotel with double beds. And so it was all very different. And I thought, oh, I want a bit more than this. So um, a couple of years later, I went back with a friend with sight in one eye. And we sort of did the usual places, New York and Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., had great fun. I went to my first Iron Maiden concert in New York and had a wild time. Ended up in the mosh pit and nearly got crushed. <laughs> so um, that's just sort of how my sort of my travels began, really. And um, by this time, I was sort of staying in hostels. So I was sort of sharing a room with six or eight strangers and different countries, different nationalities. So in this sort of young age of 18, 19, I was already sort of meeting people from different countries with different accents and speaking different languages. So it was... Um, it was a big learning curve to me, I don't know, but um, my travels properly began when um, in 2000 I got to study in the States. I did an American studies degree, sort of history, culture, literature, film, etc. And I got sent to South Carolina for four months, a place called Myrtle Beach. Oh, well, this is going to be fun. I get to sit on a beach for four months. I'm not going to do much studying, but we'll see what happens. And all my friends went down to Florida for spring break, and I thought they're not going to let me party and drink and stuff. So I'll go to New Orleans. I like a bit of blues and jazz, and I'll try to go down there and sample some more straight, strange food. So I um, got a staff at the university to help me book a flight and a hostel. And I got to New Orleans Airport, got a taxi to the hostel, and then sort of got directions from the staff. And like, oh, I want to go to Bourbon Street. So, yeah, you walk down the steps, you turn left, you walk a couple of blocks, and you find a tram stop. And after sort of sort of moments panic, I think, oh, I'm in a strange city with strange talking people, and it's very hot and humid. And I thought, how do I do this? I sort of took a few deep breaths and thought, well, this is what you want. So if you don't like it, go home. So... Took a few more deep breaths, turned left, walked a couple of blocks, someone helped me found the tram, and the rest is history, really, and I've never really looked back from that sort of moment onwards. And the journeys began. And since then, oh yeah, I've been travelling all 50 states of the US, which I sort of did gradually, um, kept going back, seeing friends and doing other trips, and then one day I was sort of really, oh, I'd done about 35, 36 states, I might as well do the rest. And why stop there? I sort of just kept traveling, really. Um, in 2001, too, I spent five months sort of traveling around Australia and New Zealand, the sort of countries where I could speak the language and I knew how the infrastructure works. And then I thought, oh, I'm confident enough to do that and I enjoy it. But let's go somewhere slightly more challenging. So I went to Vietnam and Thailand, and that was totally different. I remember walking outside the airport in Bangkok and it just hit me the smells, the heat, the sound, the honking horns chaos of traffic going in all crazy weird directions at once and when I was walking around the center of Bangkok was, I discovered open ditches and drains and broken sidewalks and uh, it was all like totally different a completely new challenge and in Vietnam I could smell the, the sewage from the river it was very stinky con combined with the humidity I rode around on motorbikes I um I stayed in a guest house in Ho Chi Minh City and each day the the owner of the guest house would get me a, a motor taxi and I'd pay him a dollar an hour US dollar an hour and he'd drive me around the city to different places and I went to the water museum and touched some tanks and I walked around a really large ex um, unexploded bomb that the US had dropped in the 60s in the Vietnam conflict, and touched machine guns, all these kinds of things. And then I went up to the Kochi tunnels on the Vietnam-Cambodia border and I got to crawl through a tunnel, which is sort of an idea of what the, uh, the little tunnels were like along the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the conflict. Exploded a, a sort of um, model of a bomb and I got, my, got to hit on a head by a piece of wood, gently. Uh, there's a booby trap so sort of I got an idea of what, what it was like in the war to some little extent and then I asked to fire a machine gun but they said no no you shoot tour guide <laughs> <laughs> so they wouldn't they wouldn't they wouldn't let me do that, but that yeah, was fascinating. It was amazing. And Tony, it's so many interesting stories and you know, it really seems like you solve your own curiosities. People say, Why do you go traveling me if you can't see? Well I said, Well, why not? Because traveling is not just about seeing the beautiful vistas or scenery it's about eating the different food and hearing new music and walking the streets and feeling the cobbles under my feet and 
walking in the mountains and feeling the gradients going up and down and through the forest and hearing birds and sea life and smelling seals or hearing penguins and ants. So it's all that. And, it's, and ultimately, of course, it's about meeting the people and immersing yourself into one's, into their culture and learning about how they live day to day. When I traveled in Africa for the first time, I went into a village in the mountains and my guide said, Tony, these women have just gone off at seven o'clock in the morning. Oh, where are they going? And they'd gone off with buckets and they walk three miles to get water and they carry it back with these buckets of water on their head and they do this every day and they can't drop any water because it's precious and they wouldn't need it to drink and wash. I said, oh, wow, we just turn the tap on water. We don't think about where it comes from. So all that experience was a real eye-opener and sort of a real education how other people in other circumstances less fortunate than myself live and survive. And to me, and that's that's what it's all about. And I love it. I love that challenge of getting from A to B each day, never quite knowing who I'm going to meet or where I'm going to end up or what might happen, particularly traveling in Africa. I've been in Africa four times. Um, first time I went to Southern Africa, spent several weeks in South Africa and sort of worked my way through Swaziland, Mozambique and across Zimbabwe and Zambia. And, and then I went back to West Africa at the time, Senegal and, and Mali. And it was all different experience each time with buses that broke down and uh, wheels would fall off the buses. I was on one bus in Zimbabwe, the engine overheated and caught fire. Now in, in America or England, if that happen you'd stop the bus and you'd wait and someone would bring a new bus but in africa you just cool the engine down for half an hour and then get back on board and continue traveling <laughs> so it's it's all different and it's yeah it's um wow the adventure the unpredictability of the next coming day that's adventurous yeah it's everything's different every day and you don't know what's going to happen and for me i find that amazing and fun and entertaining and Yes, it can be tiring, it can be challenging at times, and it can be certainly one of the first two times I travelled in Africa, my backpack would disappear into a trailer and I wouldn't wouldn't really know if I'd ever see it again. And luckily each time it did turn up. So things like that were a bit worrying and crossing borders was difficult. I had my passport over as a complete stranger and not quite know if I'd get it back. And so you walk across a bridge and then it would appear in someone else's hand. Sometimes you'd get it for free and sometimes you'd have to sort of pay a small bribe to get it back. So all that was uh, challenging and worrying. But you, you sort of, oh, you sort of, cope with it and deal with it and meeting people all the time and you make friends and I've discovered that I've been quite lucky to sort of wandering around the world with my cane sort of looking sort of quite innocent and lost and people just tend to come towards me and want to look after me so it's been quite remarkable I've been robbed a couple of times and it happens but for the most part I've been unharmed and had absolutely fantastic times and met wonderful people so it's an absolute privilege to travel and um, in 2005 I came back from a long trip I spent about 13 months travelling and my mum said oh I should write a book just so my friends can see what you get up to no I don't want to write a book I want to travel yeah yeah write a book so eventually I did and I sort of wrote and wrote and wrote on my laptop and with my speech software I um, I used the JAWS as a screen reader and a type away and I um, eventually came out with all this work and um, managed to create a book called Seeing the World My Way and I managed to find a small publisher in Bristol in the southwest of England near where I grew up and they published it so I had that for five years and then I published a second one in 2016 called Seeing the Americas My Way it was about a trip I did in 2004 traveling first in South America and Brazil and Argentina and eating fresh fruit every day and rice and fish and uh, exploring the beaches of North Brazil and then visiting tango clubs in Argentina and eventually going down all the way to the most southern city in the world called Ushuaia and then sort of coming back up through Chile and I spent three days on a boat with all these other backpackers and they were all drinking white wine and getting very merry as we sort of slowly drifted through the fields of Chile. People described the mountains with glittering glaciers clinging off the sides and towering waterfalls and it all sounded fascinating and gripping so I wrote about that and then I thought the second half of my second book so I traveled through the states and sort of up through California and through Nevada and Arizona and did some interesting things. I got to fire a, a Magnum and a machine gun in Nevada one uh, one hot afternoon and I, I rang them up in the morning and said, um, it was Memorial Day, so I wasn't sure if they'd be open. So I, I rang them up and said, um, are you open today? He said, yeah. I said, I'd like to come and fire a couple of guns. Yeah, yeah no problem. I said, um, by the way, um, I'm blind. And the line went quiet. A few minutes. I said, uh, yeah, okay. 
So I turned up about six o'clock in the evening and uh, yeah, they let me have a go. It was quite magical. And the power of firing a Magnum 44 is unbelievable. It's uh, the re- recoil, it's like um, being kicked by a horse. It- very powerful. So, and then I got to go to the Hoover Dam the next day and um, experienced the monstrosity of that, sort of walked along it and heard the sort of steam power and the noise of it all. So, yeah, and I sort of wandered off into Utah and up through Colorado, went through the Rocky National Park. And I got to sort of have the sensation of crossing the continent, continental divide and sort of feeling the thin air altitude, touched the statue of a moose, which was pretty impressive. So, um, yeah, it's all these experiences that sort of all touch and feel and sound and I visited some waterfalls. It's one of my sort of favorite things I like to do is visit waterfalls. I, mean, I can sense it all and feel the energy and the noise. But that's what kind of things I enjoy. And then I eventually wandered across Canada for three months and ended up in Alaska. So that's what sort of my second book's about. And then I kind of did a few more trips. And then I um, got diagnosed with kidney failure um, in 2004. And in 2008, I was given a kidney by my stepdad. So uh, in 2009, I continued my travels. And I decided then and there I'm going to spend the rest of my life traveling the world and see if I can visit every country. And that's what I've been doing ever since, really. And then I met, um, met my girlfriend at the end of 2009 in Greece and um, I got a website called TonyTheTraveler.com I spelled traveller with two L's and she found my website emailed me and then I went to Greece and we met up and she's also blind she went blind when she was 16 uh, she lost her sight through glaucoma so yeah now we sort of travel together we've been to the States a couple of times she's got friends in um, Indiana and uh, one in Seattle so we've been able to visit them I got friends in South Carolina where I studied yeah so yeah we've been sort of half of Europe now um, end of last year we were in Spain for Christmas met up with friends in, in Portugal so uh, yeah this is what I do and then recently like the end of last year I went to um, Israel Palestinian territories and Jordan and a BBC travel show got in touch with me and um, we had a couple of documentaries with me so that was kind of fun at the moment I'm just uh, preparing for my latest trip I'm off to Lebanon uh, next week for a month and uh, possibly going to Iraq I got a contact in uh, Basra who's invited me to South Iraq he says it's quite safe out there he runs a security company so just trying to get visas for Iraq and then we'll be off there and then uh, yeah long long may my travels continue so that's that's what I do really that's... and you reside in Timoth England yeah I live in Timoth England it's in Devon which is um almost as far southwest as you can get you say you've got friends here yeah Joanne and Rob Fishwick are in Timoth and I got friends up Steve Wickett he's up in Birmingham Oh, right. He's in the Midlands. I lived there for several years. Yeah, I, I like that side of the England. I can't compare it to the other side. I mean, as for travel goes, I was happy when I was in Vegas last week and I found Starbucks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I knew it was there. So I always tell people, like, it's easier to travel if you know something exists there. But for you, That's right. for you going into the countries when you decided to take on that challenge of doing something more challenging so you went to vietnam yeah what drove you to that what was it just the pure excitement that you've been talking about i think it was partly that it was also partly that i studied about it so i was interested in the world i was interested in the culture and the country and I, what i really wanted to know was how how did the vietnamese people how did the vietnamese army defeat the u.s army and the u.s and i wanted I'd read about it for three years, but I wanted to actually meet people and actually physically learn what it was about because I, kn- I knew books would only teach me so much. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was a combination of that, really. And that depends on who writes the book. <laughs> yeah. So that that must have been really just all this travel. So many people have travel or mobility as the, their obstacle that defeats them. And here you're mm. aiming up the last few countries that there are to for your achievement. Yeah. And I think it's because I started so young and it was sort of a natural progression. My first goal was to get home and then my next goal was to sort of go to the States. So it was always a natural progression. It was never like a a big fear of like suddenly, oh, going to a strange country and and suddenly having to deal with the public or deal with public transport at, say, 20-odd or 30-odd. It was because I did it was so young where I had no fear as you don't when you're a teenager mm-hmm. um, and, and given the confidence my teachers told me I would go out I would do this I would cross roads my mobility teacher you know and I was I was doing mathematics in braille and I was doing an algebra in braille and that was pretty remarkable enough and that, it, things like that gave me a lot of confidence so I think that had a, a huge help and a huge influence and I always had the support from my family um, 
to do the sort of traveling and go to study the states and stuff and uh, my mum sort of did worry me at the time when i was sort of 19 and 20 and and drinking and stuff but she knew that as um you know traveling the world was what i wanted to do and what i enjoyed so she didn't stop me Timoth is always full of tourists down on the southern part of England there. So that must be kind of a nice retreat. I call it a retreat because you've been traveling all these times that it seems I caught up with you at home. Yeah, it's just nice to come out. And I go, I'm on about a three-minute walk from the beach. So I go down to the beach and listen to the sea and just relax and chill out. And, you know, go to the chip shop <laughs> once a week and go to the pub. I live next door to a pub, so that's quite nice. And, yeah, meet the locals, hang out with the local people. Uh, my friend yeah. had his chips and a seagull flew down and took them right out of his hand. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, they're quite <laughs> aggressive now these days. <laughs> yeah, no, that wouldn't happen. That wouldn't that wouldn't happen in Boston, obviously. It's, I thought it was pretty interesting because they're on the cars, they're on the sidewalk, they're on that post, they're on the bench. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they got them on. The, they're on my roof now at the moment. We're probably hibernating at the moment because it's freezing. We woke up in the morning at the hotel. We we're right down there by the beach, and um, I thought it was babies crying in the night, and it was the seagulls. <laughs> the seagulls. Huh? Did you stay in the Clifton, or did you say? Uh, the first time we stayed down in a hotel. The second time we stayed in the Clifton, just uh-huh. to experience that. Uh, Joe and Rob both work there now. He's the bartender. Oh right. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, the Clifton's Clifton's nice. Ah, uh, good people. Yeah, it's nice. proximity, you know. Within five minutes, you're right down by the beach. That's it, straight down a hill. Yeah. Then we took yeah. the trolley across to the island there to just experience that a little bit and learn about oh, right. the, learn about all the coves and the pirates and the yeah. yeah. We got a few of them. Use a cane or not? Yeah, I use a cane. Yeah. Yeah, I need that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where are you based? Uh, Minneapolis. I'm just north of Minneapolis by about eight miles uh, northeast okay. of there. It's Fridley, Minnesota. Yeah, I've been a couple of times. Yeah, I've been a couple of times. Minnesota? Minneapolis. I went out to Duluth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been to Minnesota a couple of times when I was crossing the north part. I uh, went out to um, Duluth, stayed one night. I was trying to find Bob Dylan's uh, mm. where he was born, but uh, couldn't find the actual place. But yeah, wandered around by the lake there in Minneapolis. And, yeah, it's nice. Big city. So, yeah. yeah. Nice, friendly. Yeah, took the bus. So on a daily basis, what kind of technology do you use? You said you're a JAWS user, so you're obviously on a PC. Yeah, so um, I, yeah, I got a JAWS uh, on my laptop. I had, a, I had a desktop for a long time, but now just a laptop. And I, I travel with that in, in um, the Europe and the States and that. I don't take it to Africa or Asia. I use a very basic phone. So when I'm traveling, I just change the SIM card. Ah. Um, and I use, I use a basic phone with a touch keypad because um, I could take an iPhone and stuff, but it would get nicked or I would lose it. So I'm always losing phones. So I basically take a cheap one. And then, and I've also got, I've just got myself a Victor Stream and I'm probably slowly working out how to use that at the moment. And then I've got a talking book machine, Daisy, called a Daisy Player I use. Um, I listen to my audio books. I'm just about to get um, a, me Daisy books on um, flash drives. So I'll be able to travel with them. Oh, there you go. I use Braille very occasionally. I Braille. I got tactile maps on the walls of all the continents, and they've got Braille on them. Obviously, um, I can read Grade Two Braille, um, and I occasionally use it to label some things. My videos have got Braille on them, uh, but yeah, I don't use much Braille. But I, I um, I've just given a couple of talks at a couple of different universities, and um, and I've read from my first book, which is in Braille, so it's useful to know. And obviously, places like the US, I can use the um the subway the we got Braille on the ticket machines, and that's useful. And also in Europe, on some of the um, train stations in Europe, they've got Braille on the um, handrails when you go into the platform. So you um, you know which destination, if you can read the Braille in their language. So that's kind of useful for local people. I've seen that in Germany, and uh, where were we recently? Uh, I think it was Spain. But yeah, I mainly rely on the um, Jaws speech software. Um, I tried using um, NDVA, but I can't understand it. My girlfriend uses that. And she's got um she's got an iPhone or um, an Android phone. She uses, uses the speech software. I said I don't like the touch screen. I don't like the idea of sort of prodding around, hoping you'll find the right button. That frustrates me too much. But, um, and I use a scanner as well, so I can read my mail. Um, I got a it's a strange little scanner. It's like a camera thing, and you sort of it's like an L shape. You put it over the page, and it sort of takes a picture and then reads it to you. Oh yeah. I used to like the Kurzweil scanners much more. 
I trusted them more. This this one's not quite so trustworthy. Yeah, it's a bit more fiddly, but yeah. Microsoft just came out with a new application called Seeing AI. And as soon as oh, you right. open the app and you just place it over it, like about 12 to 18 inches above it, it just starts reading. Right. Yeah, you can just riffle through your mail, like see which this is from, boom, boom. You don't have to hit the buttons. You just put it in front of it and it kind of like takes a memory shot That's of good. it and starts reading it. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. That'd be kind of useful for shopping. I guess you could read each product with it. Oh, yeah. If you wanted to. That'd be kind of useful. It also has another channel in it for like reading barcodes and the, and it's free from Microsoft. So that's really yeah. It's really neat that they've come a long ways with areas, you know. Some stuff is novelty. It'll take your picture and guess your age. Sure. <laughs> kind of like a carnival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a you got a, an iPhone of you with Apple. Yeah. I, I use it. It works for me. Yeah, I hear the support quite good with Apple for um, for blind people. Mhm. Yeah. So yeah, that's good. But yeah, I like me Victor's stream. I used to, I had a book sense for a while, about five years, but then it died last year and they, they stopped some, stopped making them. The book sense is really easy to use. Mm-hmm. The, the Victor stream is similar, but it's a little bit more complicated. It's all about bookshelves and sort of move through with the arrow keys and back and forth. So yeah, I'm still sort of learning. Yeah. But apparently it's got internet on it, uh, internet on it. So that'd be quite useful once I get up and running. Yeah. That makes it handy. Yeah. Yeah. So people people could actually download your book on it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so you do have two books out, right? Yeah, I've got two books out. They're both e-books now only. So they're not in print anymore. Um, hmm. My first book's available in audio and braille from the R&IB. So people in the UK can borrow it if they're members of the library or buy it. Um, but yeah, both my books are available on Kindle and all e-book format. So Barnes & Noble, The Nook, Kobo. So hopefully people of vision impaired blind can download it and listen to them. And get a laugh out of them, if nothing else. They're very funny. My sort of entertaining stories and kinds of mischief I get up to and describe bungee jumping at one point and skydiving and all kinds of different things. So, yeah. Wow, that's trust. Hopefully they got the right size rope for bungee jumping on the right size jump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've not come a cropper so far. <laughs> Yeah, adventuring and all that stuff. Like like I mentioned before, I, I'm happy when I found a few places. And then we do a lot of podcasts with transition age students yep. embarking upon going from high school to college to the workplace. And that's all ahead of them. Sure. What advice would you have for someone who is apprehensive about like travel or adventuring further than what their limited expectations of them are put upon them? So what advice would you have for someone? Yeah. It all you know. It sounds quite daunting. The idea of, of catching a bus or catching a train to try and get from one place to the other um, on your own. You're not quite sure well where the transportation work. Will you be able to find a stop to get on and get off? And will people help you? Um, kind of like that tram in New Orleans. Yeah, just sort of try and do your research as much, much as possible. You know, research where you're getting on and where you're getting off, and also sort of you know. Talk to people. Try and have the confidence to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to talk to people and ask questions because most people will help you if um, you give them a chance and, you know, you sort of approach them in the right way. Um, people are only too happy to help for the most part. Do simple journeys to start with. That's what I did. I sort of did simple journeys and built up my confidence and then sort of continue from there, really. And don't be afraid to make mistakes because you do. I, I still now, you know, I've been traveling for 20 years and I still make mistakes. When I was in London the other day, and I, I knew where I wanted to go, and I got the, uh, I thought, oh, this is my tube train, and it was the wrong one. It was the right line, but it was, wasn't was going to the destination I wanted. So I heard, heard the announcements, and I thought, oops. And so I got off at the next stop mm-hmm. and retraced my my steps, and then asked someone, said, yeah, you want, no, you want this, this way, and it's um, three more stops, and then I got off, and then a member of staff met me and helped me out at the station. So, you know, happens to the best of us. But yeah, confidence is the key, building up your confidence and, and don't being afraid to ask for help because we all need help whether we can see or not. So, and go for it. So, Tony, can you tell your website once more to the listeners? Yeah, sure. So my website is www.tonythetraveler, T-O-N-Y-T-H-E-T-R-A-V-E-L-L-E-R.com. And there's blogs on there, articles, videos, and audio and all kind of interesting stuff. So what kind of preparation are you doing for your next one? You said you're getting your visas ready and all that. 
Yeah, so get my um, get my visas ready. I'm finding accommodation in um, Beirut, Lebanon, for my first couple of nights, and I'm trying to find local people I can meet up with, and they can, um, you know, ex- um, ex- learn about their culture, or they can sort of show me around. And then I'm research re- researching the cities I want to visit. Um, so I'm interested in sort of ancient historical places. So I'm just on the internet at the moment, looking up Lonely Planet, rough guide about each city, Beirut in particular. That's the capitals. That's the biggest city. Mm-hmm. And then I got to research how to get from the airport into the city so i'll be looking at that later whether it's a bus or a tram or a taxi and then i gotta uh, find out what the currency is um exchange rate and then i get my currency next week before i leave and then on monday i need to book a train so i get assistance in the uk um if you want to go I usually travel by train because for me it's cheaper than the bus and it's quicker. So um, I have to go all the way to London, which takes me four hours. So I'll book assistance. I'll call the number and I'll say I'm going from this station to London. And I'll tell them the changes. I look it on, up online and then I, they book me assistance. Someone helps me on at Timworth and meets me at the change and takes me all the way. Um, meets me in London and then they take me up to the airport. And someone else escorts me to the check-in desk. So I got to book all that. I'm um, also got to book my assistance for the um, air company. I got to ring them up on Monday as well and check that's booked. Should be. So yeah, and um, you've done this before. Yes. <laughs> yeah, many okay. times. Yeah. So and a few other little things. Yeah, pack. Probably pack Wednesday night and I go down to London Wednesday, stay with a friend, and then um, yeah, fly out Thursday. Oh wow. So um, yeah, get getting excited. Another new country. There you go. Another one to the list. Have you counted yeah. the countries yet? Yeah. I'm up to 125 unofficially. Officially, according to the UN, there's 193 countries. And all them, I visited 110. But they don't include countries like Greenland or the Falkland Islands mm. as, as individual countries. So, um, but yeah, getting on there. <laughs> um, I say I've also been to all, all, all 50 states of the US as well. Yeah, it's keeping me busy. Keep me out of trouble. If someone wanted to follow you on Twitter, do you have Twitter, Facebook, or anything? I, I, I have Facebook. Um, Tony, uh, capital T, space, the, T-H-E, small letters, Traveler, capital T. Um, I'm not on Twitter. I don't bother with that. All right. Um, there's not enough time in the day for Twitter. But yeah, I'm on Facebook quite regularly. People can follow me. I, quite, I blog, blog quite frequently on Facebook. Well, I'll look these up and I'll put some links in the show notes for you so that people can click on them. Yeah, great. And my um, people can look me up as Tony Giles, G I L E S, as well. Well, great. So, should be able to find me. Well, Tony, you have a yeah. marvelous trip to Lebanon and then to I, I, Iran, right? Iraq, Iraq. Iraq, if possible, yeah. Wait, Iraq, where? Southern Iraq. Somewhere on Earth. It's too, it's too bad you got to limit it to Earth. I know, I know. <laughs> Once they get a, a, a regular shuttle to the Mars, I'll be off. There you go. That <laughs> it might be happening within the next 100 years or so. <laughs> probably, le- probably less. Yeah, yeah. The way they're going. I could be the first blind man in space. That'd be You'd fun. You'd be the man on the moon. <laughs> yeah. Tony Jack. Uh, I might have an app for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Well, uh, Tony, thank you so much for taking the time out of your travels, your day and everything. Say hi to the people in Timoth for me. And uh, well, thanks for coming on The Blind Abilities. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Cheers. What a great pleasure it was to talk to Tony Giles, backpacking around the world. Tony the Traveler and his book, Seeing the World My Way. So be sure to check him out on the web. Check him out on the Facebook. Check the show notes. we got some links in there for you. And I really want to thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed. And until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through through each each other's other's eyes, eyes, we can then then begin begin to bridge bridge the the gap between between the limited limited expectations and the reality reality of blind abilities. abilities. blind abilities. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. On Twitter at Blind Abilities. Download our app from the App Store, Blind Abilities, that's two words. Or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.